The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Let's get started. Welcome everyone to The Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. My name is David McFadgen, and I'll be your host today. And I'm very excited to welcome back Howard Bloom to the store. This time is a sense maker in residence for a three part series called Everything You Know About Nature is Wrong The Case of the Blooming Cosmos. Um, I think most of you know the drill, but just in case you're new, uh, drop questions in the chat. Um, we prefix it with word question or a cue, so it's easy to find. Uh, we'll give Howard the floor for the first um, part of the session, 20 or 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A after that. So Howard, welcome back. Um, thanks, David. Thanks, Peter. Um, okay, here's the deal. Um, David did something extremely clever. He took my books out of the order in which they were written, and he put them in chronological order so that we tell the story of the universe in my books. And then he invited me to come here and in three sessions to tell you the story of the universe. So first of all, I wanna tell you a story of the universe tonight that breaks some of the most basic underlying laws of science. One is Aristotle's idea from roughly 350 BC in his metaphysics, that if you break everything down to the tiniest elements, what he called, well, the element, he called them the elements, um, and you figure out the laws of those elements, you understand everything in the universe. That's not true. And uh, we're going to hopefully show you why. Second law, um, Pierre-Louis de Maupertuis uh, in 1744 um, came up with what he called the law of least effort. And that's been underlying science ever since, even if you never heard of it, because the idea is the universe does everything in the most parsimonious way possible. The universe is a pinch penny. Uh, the universe is a miser. And she spends as little energy as she can on anything that happens in this universe. That law is absolutely not true. And it underlies our science today. Um, the third idea, is Lord Kelvin's idea from the 1850s that the universe is gonna break down in heat death. Um, that you, know, you put a sugar cube into your cup of coffee and you stir it and eventually the sugar cube disappears. And that's what will happen to the universe. And then there's the related idea, and this is really the big monster in science because it's so wrong. It's uh, the law of entropy which Rudolf Clausius came up with in 1865 after Lord Kelvin had come up with heat death. And then it was advanced um, further by Ludwig Boltzmann around 1875, who gave it a statistical basis. And the idea of entropy is that the universe is constantly breaking down. And that absolutely is not true. Okay, so how did we get to the title of the case of the blooming universe, the case of the blooming cosmos? Um, I used to try to explain to my wife that the universe is unfolding like a, a flower, like leaves on a tree um, in spring. And I kept telling her the universe exfoliates. And she said, you've got to stop using that word, exfoliates. It's used in beauty treatments for taking skin, the dead skin off of women. Um, and so for years, she was complaining about my use of this word. And then she finally came up with a synonym for exfoliates. Remember, it's the universe exfoliates. Blooms. Now, that just happens to be my name, but that's what the universe does. It unfolds like a flower. So imagine, you and I are sitting around at a coffee table at the, before the beginning of the cosmos. And there never has been a cosmos, and there never will be a cosmos. And, you and I have piled up 38,000 coffee cups. We've been here for a long time. And you're the energetic and visionary one. And I'm the crusty old fart. And you suddenly perk up one 
period of time that doesn't exist, um, and say, see, over there, there's going to be a pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick, and it's going to contain the workings of an entire universe. And I say to you, wait, look, we've, we've been around here a long time, even though time doesn't exist yet. And, um, and we've piled up over 38,000 coffee cups, and the waiter is getting very tired of seeing us over and over again. And in all this time, of course, remember, time doesn't exist, but in all of this time, there never has been a print prick infinitely smaller than a pen prick. And the idea that if there were, that there should be one is absurd. And the idea that if there were one, it would contain an implicit universe. I mean, that's absolutely insane. And all of a sudden, a pen prick infinitely smaller than a pen prick shows up about 30 feet off to our left. Um, and, uh, and it starts to expand at a speed that is utterly beyond belief. Not only has it come into existence in a totally inexplicable manner, but it contains a number of properties, three, space, time, and speed. This is impossible. Coming from absolutely nothing, space, time, and speed, you've got to be kidding me. And then you make another of your crackpot predictions. You say that any 10th of the minus 32nd of a second now, we're going to see the precipitation of the very first things. And I say, look, um, you got it right on one lucky guess. But when it comes to things, there never will be things. There never have been things. Remember, remember the name of this place where we are, the nothing, the no thing. Why? Because there never have been things, there never will be things. And all of a sudden, precipitating from this giant unfurling, giant's handkerchief sheet of space, time, and speed, there come the first things. And they're leptons and quarks. And, and if this were a universe of six monkeys and six typewriters, um, someday eventually typing out the works of Shakespeare, and everything were born on, on random mutation, random chance, um, there would be, since there are 10 to the minus or 10 to the 81th power things, um, there would be 10 to the 81th power different kinds of things, which would have no relationship to each other whatsoever. But that's not true. There are only 57 different kinds of things. For example, there are only 16 different kinds of quarks. And quarks all over this unfurling sheet of space and time, this universe, come out in only those 16 different forms with gazillions of identical copies of each of those 16 different forms. Then something else really dramatic happens. Those first things, those quarks, are incapable of living on their own. They need company. They are profoundly social, or they don't survive. So they get together in groups of three and groups of two instantly. Remember, this is the 10 to the minus 30 second, first second, uh, or, or sliver, or sliver, or sliver of a second of the universe. And when they get together, something else happens. Now, to explain what happens, let's go back to Aristotle. So remember, Aristotle said if you break things down to their smallest elements, what we would call elementary particles, and you understand their laws, you understand everything you need to know about this universe. Now, quarks have certain properties. And if you and I had been given lots of time to study these quarks, we would have seen what their properties were. And if Aristotle was right, we'd be able to predict everything from knowing the properties of quarks. That's not the way it works at all. Three quarks like this, first of all, Aristotelian logic, quarks in, quarks out, one plus one equals two. Um, they come together in groups of three like this. And others come together in groups of three like this. And the, this kind of groups of three makes something that's utterly beyond quarks, so totally beyond quarks that it defies belief. And those things become protons. And the other ones, um, the other trios of quarks become neutrons. And the properties of neutrons and the properties of protons are absolutely not predictable from the properties of quarks. 
Um, something is going on here. It certainly isn't entropy. The universe is not breaking down. The universe is building up. Even in that 10 to the minus 30 seconds of a spat second of the universe, things are building up. It's as if, I mean, if, if we proceed, the universe is a soup of high speed particles for between 300,000 and 380,000 years. And those high speed particles are crashing into each other at speeds that make two bullets colliding head on look sluggish. And they're ricocheting off of each other. And then they're slamming into other particles at this extraordinary speed and somehow retaining their identity. The threesomes of quarks do not come apart. Um, in these incredible smashes and bangs of the bump and car universe. But even in the bump and car universe, at the three, first 300,000 to 380,000 years of the universe's existence, there is a strange kind of what, what George Henry Lewis in 1870 called emergent properties. Um, the, these bump and car smashups are somehow coming together and then spreading apart. And when they come together, they make the peaks of waves. And when they come apart in mass quantities, they make the troughs of waves. And those waves go rippling across the cosmos like music on a gong. And in fact, the scientists who discovered this about 20 years ago called it music because it was so musical, the more technically they're called pressure waves. But this is cooperative mass behavior on a massive scale, even among things that are, that are hitting each other so hard you think they rip each other apart. Um, and then 300,000 to 380,000 years later, the temperature cools. Now, what does that mean? Temperature is speed. Um, and that means the speed of these particles decreases. And there are these giant particles that relatively speaking are the size of the Empire State Building. There are these tiny little particles that relatively speaking are the size of your fist. And if you were to tell me, you know, you the visionary, that those little particles are gonna have an inanimate longing and the giant particles are gonna have an inanimate longing. I mean, first of all, you're crazy. This is anthropomorphism. This can't possibly exist. Not at all. This is totally unscientific, what you're telling me. Um, and if you were to predict that the, that the inanimate longing of the tiny little particles the size of your fist, relatively speaking, are going to discover that their inanimate longing precisely fits the inanimate longing of these things over 1,800 times their size, I would know you are nuts. Period. You know, you've got a couple of guesses right here, but this one is so bizarre, it is ridiculous, and it's anthropomorphic. And guess what? The temperature slows down. The little tiny things discover that they fit precisely the great big giant things. They fulfill each other in some strange way. The little tiny things are electrons. The great big giant things are protons. And when they come together, they form the first atoms. And just as with those quark threesomes that got together, you would, using Aristotelian logic, if you add an electron and a proton, all you're going to get is the properties of an electron and a proton, right? Wrong. You get these supersized surprises. You get these utterly shocking new properties. We call one aspect of the property atom, an atom. Uh, we call another aspect of these properties hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And all of these things are totally unpredictable from knowing the properties of an electron and a proton. So we haven't talked about the law of least effort yet. We'll get to that in a little bit. But this is the opposite of Lord Kelvin's heat death. This is, this is cool birth as a matter of fact, the very opposite of Kelvin. And this is the very opposite of entropy. Things are not falling apart in a random whistle. Things are falling together. 
It's as if the universe has a set of invisible stairs and it is going, imagine shooting a slinky going down a staircase and then playing the tape in reverse. Um, it's like the slinky going up the staircase and the number of new properties the cosmos comes up with are nowhere near random. Um, remember, there are only three kinds of atoms in the beginning of the universe with gazillions of copies of each of those three kinds all over the place, no matter where you look. This is far from random. This is a rigidly constrained universe. And it is not being entropic, not in the least, because a very short amount of time after these first atoms come together, another bizarre thing happens that if you predict it to me, I would say you were nuts. And you would tell me that these new things, these atoms, are going to discover that they have a kind of whispering force that draws them together, another social force. Because we've been dealing all right now with everything I've described with a social universe and a communicative universe. Um, electrons communicate with protons. That's how they get together. Um, the properties of communication are what define hydrogen, helium, and lithium. They're what define an atom. And in fact, I tell you, you are absolutely crazy, despite the fact that you've been right a couple of times so far. And all of a sudden, these new things, these atoms, discover there is a quiet, whispering property that draws them together, a force. It's gravity. And over the course of roughly the next million years, gravity draws these atoms together in gravity balls of increasing size. The gravity balls go up against each other. They compete. The larger gravity ball always beats the smaller gravity ball, or as Jesus put it in Matthew, uh, to he who hath it shall be given. From he who hath not, even what he hath shall be taken away. We have the period of what I call the great gravity crusades. And the larger balls swallow the smaller balls. And then they come up against even larger competitors and their larger competitors swallow them. And the result of this are these giant sort of lumpy potato shaped agglomerations of matter, proto galaxies. And within those galaxies, some gravity balls are incredibly successful at swallowing other gravity balls. And eventually those gravity balls ignite and they become stars. And some gravity balls very cleverly work out a compromise um, with bigger gravity balls. Instead of being swallowed by them, they uh, circle them at a very specific distance, and it allows them to stay alive. And those compromising gravity balls are planets. And then there are planetesimals that would normally be swallowed, but they work out a compromise with the planets and circle them, and those are moons. By the way, what we've seen here is, it is generally assumed that capitalism and the post-industrial era, um, the, the Howard is frozen. We I'm stuck. Uh, Even in the in the uh, coalescing of the first atoms. Sorry, Howard. Um, yep. You froze for about ten seconds. Do you remember what you said? Let me take this out, put it back in. You're okay. Back. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Okay. This this landline just doesn't really work. So at any rate, we are told that that competition and dominance hierarchies are the product of capitalism and the industrial revolution and or even of agriculture. And none of that is true. You've just seen in the coalescing of the early cosmos. You've seen 
competition between gravity balls. It's what builds galaxies, stars, planets, and moons. And you've just seen dominance hierarchies. In those first atoms, the proton was 18 times, uh, 1800 times the size of the electron. What does that mean? It means that the proton determines where a, an atom goes because it has all the mass. Um, and the electron goes around the proton. It circles the proton. So there you have a dominance hierarchy. When solar systems form, and when, first of all, when suns make their compromises with the heart of a galaxy and orbit around the heart, in the case of our solar system, we go around the entire galaxy once every 235 million years, approximately. And when planets work out their compromise with stars, and when moons work out their compromise with planets, you have dominance hierarchies. So, okay, let's go back to heat death. Sorry, you've just seen the absolute opposite of heat death. Let's go back to entropy. What is entropy all about? Entropy was an idea that came from a really exciting new idea. And the exciting new idea back in 1850 or so was that heat was movement. Heat was the movement of atoms and molecules. Okay, now here's the trick. There was no such thing as atoms and molecules um, in 1850. Um, to propose that there might be atoms and molecules was a really, really bold thing to do. Even 50 years later, 55 years later, when Einstein came along, there, there was still no consensus that there were atoms and molecules. So thermodynamics said temperature was caused by the movement of particles that nobody had proven existed yet. Very exciting idea. And somehow the idea of entropy, which was born of steam engines, Steam engines were the big deal at the time. And the idea was that once you had captured a certain amount of heat in steam and used it, the rest was wasted. And the rest simply dissipated into the atmosphere. Well, the generalization that everything dissipates that way was enormous. And it wasn't questioned. And it hasn't been questioned. And today, if you do not recite entropy, and if you do not recite its laws about closed systems and open systems and all of that nonsense, you are not considered a legitimate scientist. And I'm sorry, the idea of entropy goes opposite to everything you've just seen about the cosmos. This is a cosmos building up. This is not a cosmos building down. This is a cosmos climbing a staircase of supersized surprise. This is more, more than that, um, nature loves those who oppose her most. What does that mean? Nature loves those who break her laws and in the process establish new laws. And you've basically seen that with the formation of atoms, you've seen that with the formation of galaxies, you've seen that with the formation of stars. And when life comes along, um, a long time later, 10 billion years later, you will see it over and over and over again, that nature rewards those who break her laws and in the process find, discover, or create new laws. So, and what haven't we covered here? We've covered entropy, heat death, and Aristotle. And, but emergent properties are still, oh, my emergent, my internet connection is unstable. Can you still see me? Okay, good. Um, so God knows where I just left off, but emergent properties, uh, John Stuart Mill and his friend, George Henry Luce, who was the boyfriend of the author who called herself George Eliot, were sitting around a living room and they were musing about something very un-Aristotelian. If you took a bell jar filled with one gas and put it on your table and another bell jar with a different gas on the other table, Hydrogen and helium are the two gases. Now, according to Aristotle, you should be able to predict everything you need to know by knowing the properties of these two gases. And they're both transparent and you can put your hand through them and a bunch of other properties and both pretty much the same. 
if you take these two bell jars of gas, the hydrogen and the helium, and you strike a match and you put it in, you get several properties that are utterly unpredictable from knowing the properties of these two gases. One is an explosion, which is really a big surprise. Hopefully you're not gonna blind yourself with the shattering of the glass. And the second is this bizarre substance that lays there on a table wibbling and wobbling. And if it slides off the table and onto your lap, you're not gonna to wanna to walk around until it dries because you're gonna embarrass yourself. It's a liquid, it's called water. It's one of the most surprising substances in this entire universe. So George Henry Lewis and, and John Stuart Mill are trying to contemplate the fact that despite the fact that, that, that the West has been using equations to understand things since the days of Newton. Um, this does not fit any equations, this wibbling wobbling stuff that can embarrass you if it falls onto your lap and the explosion itself. And George Henry Luce comes up with a word for this, emergent properties. But they make no progress whatsoever in understanding what emergent properties are and how emergent properties come to be. Well, it's 150 years later since those two guys sat in that living room and came up with this phrase. And we still do not have a clue as to how we can predict emergent properties, how we can understand emergent properties. It's the biggest puzzle we've got. Um, and we're going to have to grapple with it or science isn't science yet. Science is not even in its infancy. Science is an embryo if it can't understand these things. So that's basically my presentation. We could cover the history of the universe all the way up to what's going on in your brain and mind today while we're having this conversation. And what we discover at every step of the way is it's a blooming universe. In other words, it unfolds like a flower and constantly produces new supersized surprises. And, but science doesn't have a handle on this process and science is ignoring the process. And the first two rules of science are these, the truth at any price, including the price of your life, and look at things run right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Look at look for things that everybody around you and you take for granted, bring them into visibility, and then proceed from there. Well, George Henry Luz um, and John Stuart Mill brought emergent properties into this 150 years ago. They're still right under our nose every time we look at the history of the evolution of this cosmos and we still don't have a clue. Awesome, thank you. So I'm gonna warm up Howard with a couple questions, but in the meantime, please start dropping your questions in chat and I will call on you to ask your question. So Howard, um, I wanna push back a little bit on your opposition to entropy. Like I. I understand that it is the orthodoxy that you can't be a serious scientist if you don't um, say or recite the laws of entropy. But it seems to me that um, you're kind of complaining two concepts here, complexity and entropy here. And if for a system, if it's very, very high entropy, meaning it's very highly disordered, it's simple. If it has very, very low entropy, it's very ordered, it's also simple. So somewhere in between what the complexity scientists call the edge of chaos is where the emergent properties arise. That's where you get the properties of water, that's where you get the properties of life, that's where you get the properties of social systems and consciousness. Um, how do you think about that in your system, in your model? Well, Entropy is sort of like, in order to understand how an automobile works, it's measuring the exhaust. And it's trying to understand what an engine is from the exhaust, that, that's ridiculous. It's trying to understand how wheels work from the exhaust or how a steering wheel works from the exhaust. Why don't you just look at the car? And the, the, the evolution of the cosmos, which I've been putting together. I've been putting together this story since I was 13 years old, piece by piece by piece by piece. And if you look at the evolution of the cosmos and start from there and then build up, you, 
you understand a whole lot more of what you need to understand. This business of measuring things as neg entropy is, is silly. I mean, first of all, the human mind cannot understand double negatives. And entropy constantly traps us in the position of trying to understand things through double negatives, and it distracts enormous amounts of energy from looking at what we've discovered about this universe um, in the course of the first 350 years of science. So I argue against entropy. I mean, look, it's in Alice in Wonderland, I think it is, the Red Queen probably, um, says sometimes I, I, um, un, I, I, I contemplate six impossible things before breakfast. Well, being able to recite an impossibility, the idea of entropy, is a requirement for admission into the world of science. But think of all the brain power it wastes when we could be looking at how this universe blossoms, how this universe blooms, how this universe unfolds. There are so many mysteries buried in that unfolding process that it defies belief, but we are wasting our brain power on looking at double negatives and understanding engine, the engine through the exhaust. So you don't actually think the heat death of the universe is a valid prediction? Like if we waited, I forget how long it is, a trillion years? You don't um, it is about prediction, but it's not a prediction that's going to come true. I mean, everything we know about the universe's unfolding, its evolution, tells us that just isn't going to happen. The universe is just going to keep climbing new stair steps of form. And you know that in my book, The God Problem, um, the God Problem pretty much ends with a theory of the beginning, middle, and end of the universe that I came up with when I was 16 years old. I, I had established my first scientific credentials when I was 12. I was now working at the world's largest cancer research facility. I had no interest in the research going on there because I was captured by something called the CPT problem. The CPT problem is the charge parity and time problem. And basically it boils down to this. If matter and antimatter are created in equal amounts at the same time, where's all the antimatter? Okay, so I came up with a toroidal theory of the cosmos, a bagel theory of the cosmos. Imagine a bagel with one of those infinitely tiny anal retentive little holes at the center. And when the Big Bang happens, the normal universe comes out of the top of the bagel. The antimatter universe comes out of the bottom of the bagel. Now remember, space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to bend, right? So coming out of the bagel's hole, you have a very steep curve. What does that mean? Inflation. So this theory uh, anticipated inflation before Alan Guth put the idea on the map by about 25 years. And then what does the flattening of the bagel's curve at the top and the bottom mean in terms of movement? It means things slow down. But then what happens once the two universes go over the hump? And again, the curve grows steeper and steeper as they approach each other. It means that matter speeds up, it accelerates, which is exactly what was discovered in 1998. Uh, and today it's called dark energy, that acceleration of the universe away from itself. And why is the universe accelerating away from itself in this bagel model? Because there's a common language between the matter universe and the antimatter universe. And that language is gravity. And basically, the universe is doing what a cannonball does when you shoot it into the air. It's going to its furthest arc, the furthest arc allowed by its energy, and then the whispering between the two universes of gravity, the attraction of gravity starts pulling them further and further toward, or faster and faster toward each other until they annihilate on the outer rim. And, and the outer rim where they annihilate becomes the whole at the beginning of the next big bagel, which means that in essence, the universe does something that we see all over the place in nature. It goes like this. What else goes like this? Photons go like this. So presumably, I was not telling you the truth when I said that we're sitting at our cafe table at the beginning or before the beginning of the universe, and suddenly a 
a pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick comes from the nothingness. Because in reality, if big bagel theory is true, that pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick comes from the annihilation of two universes at the bagel's outer rim. And because, look, I discarded this theory when I was 16 years old because it was so utterly simple. I thought it was comic book science. And then came inflation in roughly 1982 with Alan Gott. And then in 1998 came dark energy. And this theory not only had predicted these things, it explained them. I've got a related question from David Swedlow. Is the bagel a hop vibration? A hop vibration? What is a hop vibration? H O P F. H O P F. No, I don't know. What is a hop vibration? I mean, yes, this is a vibration. Yes, it's like, this is like every other wave we know in the universe. This is not just like the waves in the ocean. It's like the waves of sound through which we are communicating right now. It's like the waves of photons. Um, the wave is a very popular form in nature. And, and in my books, especially in The God Problem, I talk about ur patterns, these basic patterns that are fundamental to the universe that show up on level after level after level of emergence. And one of the primary forms is the wave. And one of the primary rules is attraction and repulsion. Opposites are joined to the hip. Attraction and repulsion go together. What is a wave? Uh, a wave goes to its amplitude and then comes back to nothing and then goes to its amplitude again. That's attraction and repulsion. But what is a hub, whatever it is? Hub vibration. Yes. Um, I'll drop a link in chat just in case okay. you're interested in following up later. But in the meantime, uh, we have a question from Gopi. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Gopi Mattel. Hello. Hi, this is Gopi. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Gopi. Um, hi, hi, Howard. Uh, my question was, you kind of alluded to a little bit of the evolutionary aspects of early cosmos and competition was uh, popping up, but is there evidence for other behaviors of evolution algorithm like uh, altruism, kinship, and various other more sophisticated things we see in life? Uh, not at like the that? early stages of the universe. Um, those things I think are, are unique um, to life, except and this is a little bit weird, but okay, a wave goes to its maximum and then it goes back to its minima and then it goes back to its maxima again. And that the fact that that process exists at all is startling and astonishing. The fact that a wave knows in its own way what its maxima is, and then goes back to a minima, to a nothingness, and then goes back to a maxima again, is beyond astonishing. The fact that a wave will continue to do that for, we've seen waves of light from the first billion years of the cosmos, which means we've seen waves of light that have been traveling across this cosmos for over 12 billion years. And for over 12 billion years, they've been rigidly adhering to a maxima and a minima and a maxima and a minima. And, and, and the theory of entropy tells us that there are no um, perpetual motion machines in this universe. Well, what about that electron going around uh, a proton? Um, what about this photon, which just keeps going, which somehow goes to a minima? And what does this have to do with altruism? There's something weird and almost proto-altruistic about a wave coming to a minima, to a nothingness, and then expanding again to its full amplitude and then collapsing. And for waves to do this, I think it's uh, for yellow light, 178,000 times a second. And to do this for 12 billion years, Utterly, utterly, utterly beyond astonishing, and it may have something weird to do with altruism. Thank you. That was good. Okay, thank you. Um, Lynn, 
you have a question? Um, Howard, thanks for coming on the STOA. Um, and it's such a fractal thing that you just did in terms of like explaining things and like, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. I want to ask the question though, um, what are the implications? So I'm going to just refer to my question to kind of keep it tight in the chat, but so kind of get the emergent properties and the building of the universe. And it's kind of like, what's our position, right? The us, the civilization. And is there any intentionality or whatever, or is it like everything's going to smash together as dust and we are maybe, you know, not part of that or whatever, and then form again. So I guess it's the basis for hope um, in such a, what seems like a mechanistic process you're talking about. So, you know, is there some processes that support the emergence and I've got it like in a graceful life-saving arc, right? Or right. Sustained, you know, sustained kind of beauty. Like it feels now like smashing and dust and forming and like, where's the human? Oh, the human is extraordinarily important in this cosmos because this is a universe feeling out her possibilities, feeling out her potential and using all of her creations or creatures or whatever you want to call them, even elementary particles as probes um, into possibility space to find the next great emergent property or what I call the next supersized surprise because these things are shocking when they come up. And what are we? We are the fingertips of a nature probing her possibilities. Imagine you've lost your contact lens in a shag rug and you spread your fingers out as far as they can go and you, you work your way with your fingers through the rug trying to find the contact lens. Well, those are five different antennae you're using to feel out that contact lens. You're using your hand as a search engine for the moment. We humans are like the fingertips of that probe of a universe searching for her next possibilities. And how does nature tell us, this is gonna sound very weird, Lynn, how does nature tell us what she wants of us? Um, according to Carl Sagan, we were born with the dream of flight. He imagines that it's been with us ever since we came off the savannas. There's no evidence for that. One way or the other, we do know that ever since the myth of Daedalus, which is uh, 800 BC, we have been dreaming of flying. And if you look at that dream, the history of that dream over the course of the last 2,500, 2,800 years, um, we have been multi, it's a multi-generational task. No single generation has achieved flight. But a, there was a guy named George Cayley. He came up with the idea of a vertical stabilizer. But there was nothing to fly in his time. So the idea of a vertical stabilizer, if you were his wife or his mother, you would have said, George, get off it already. Do something serious for a living. There is no flying machine. Um, a vertical stabilizer makes no difference in a world with no flying machines. But generation after generation, we put together the pieces. And now we can fly every day if we want to. Um, or at least we can if COVID ever releases its grip on us. We were born with the dream of flight one way or the other. We were born with the dream of peace. Now we can only trace it back historically to Isaiah who said, and they shall turn their, their, their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Wonderful, wonderful dream. We've been dreaming this for at least 2,800 years. And like flight, it is a multi-generational process. We've been dreaming of a just and even a compassionate universe. And as you said, in talking about the dusts, um, this is anything but a compassionate universe. This is a universe in which the positives outweigh the negatives because we they keep piling up. Um, but the negatives are severe and brutal and mean. And we were dream we were born with this dream of making this universe compassionate and just. What put that dream in us? Nature put that dream in us. What does that indicate? Well, it indicates that we made a big mistake in 1850. Up, up until 1850, there were several ways of, of, of talking about causality. Um, Aristotle had mapped them out, and I forget his complicated names for these things, 
but you could describe the cause of something by looking at what came before it. And you could look, you could explain the cause of something by looking at what it was tending toward. In other words, how do you grow corn? Or why do you grow corn? Well, I put I put seeds in the ground, that's a prior causality, then the corn comes up, and I do it in order to feed my family. Feeding the family is a telos. It's a future goal, determining the present. Well, look at these dreams inside of us. Those seem to indicate that when we threw out telos, which we did in 1850, um, we may have thrown out something very important. And this universe, I think of it, I'm an atheist, but I think of this in terms of a vision and a letter my father sent me one day trying to save my soul when I was dropping out of society and becoming a hippie and there were no names for hippies yet. Um, and basically what he described was a universe on a long, slow march into the arms of God. And what is God? Well, Yuval Harari says this, I say this, God is not something out there in the universe that created the universe. God is an imagining within us, an aspiration that we are trying to seek. And God is the goal toward which we are moving, Com a complete comprehension of absolutely everything. That's the basic law of science, um, to go for omniscience, the understanding of absolutely everything, omnipotence, the ability to influence everything, uh, the ability, for example, to, if we want to, to freeze the climate the way it was in 1650. If we want to achieve that, hey, we've achieved a hell of a lot more in the past, and we will achieve this in the future. Whether it's a good idea or not, who knows? Um, but so we are built one way or the other. We're built with goals inside of us, and they're multi-generational goals, and we can't help what we dream. And the dream of peace, I would suggest, or I haven't been able to track it in in Chinese society, I haven't been able to track it in Islamic society, but I would suspect that it's universal. Um, and what does that mean? Nature has built a telos into us. And one way or the other, we are the fingertips of nature's search engine, the search engine of her possibilities. She used atoms to seek out her possibilities. That's how she discovered a possibility she didn't know up until then, which is that an electron can circle a proton at a certain distance, a very precise distance, and never exist in the space in between, and never fall in to the proton at its center. And if it needs to, if it gets enough energy to move out of the circle of its orbit, it goes to another very precise shell without existing in between. That's a possibility of nature, nature discovered through the atom, but presumably was implicit all along. Think of the implicit properties that nature is using us to discover. In your lifetime, Lynn, humanity has gone through so many singularities that it's ridiculous. With the invention of the laptop, with the invention of a computer that could be democratized, period, with the invention of the laptop, with the invention of the smartphone, with the invention of Facebook and Google. Um, these things have changed humanity so dramatically, it's ridiculous. And these are just, even if we go into a dark ages for another 500 years, believe me, we will come out of it ripping, roaring, and finding those things very much like the unseen jumps that an electron can take. The next super size surprise. Any follow up question? Um, uh, Howard, thank you. Um, and I love that idea of um, that we are the we are the extent we are the fingertips, the fingernails of you know the la the 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 current evolution of everything, right? And that we are the senses into nature. So I love that. I mean, I'd I could talk all night with you and I would ask you things like, where does emotions fit? And my, But there's other questions. So right. uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Lynn. Uh, nice to see you, Raven. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, it's good to see you too. Um, hi, Howard. Hi. Uh, it's great to see you here at the STOA. I'm super excited about it. Um, 
my question was about time. So you've mentioned speed. You've mentioned, now you mentioned teleology. Uh, you've mentioned this kind of unfolding process. So how do you fit time into your, your model of the, of the universe? Well, time is one of the greatest mysteries of all, and I'm still barely, barely comprehending it. But I, I co-wrote a paper with a partner at the Kelvish Institute of Applied Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Sciences about quantum physics. And in that paper, we worked on his concept of time. And his concept of time is that time is like a staircase. And on a staircase, the horizontal part is a unit of time. Then there's the riser in between the two stairs. And there is no time in that riser. Time is infinite in that riser. And what does time do? What does time do? Time is a translator. Time, time presumably operates on Planck units. There are 10 to the 43rd power Planck units in a second. In a second. And in each one of those steps of time, basically what happens is you've got a step of time that takes place. Then there is all the time in the world. And in all the time in the world, the future consults the present, looks over all the possibilities, chooses one, and then becomes a stair step. And that stair step becomes the past immediately because the next stair step of time consults the position of all the particles in the universe and all the emergent properties in the universe and comes to a conclusion about how to translate that into the next step of time. And then wham, it's frozen as the present. And the present immediately becomes the past, and it's time to consult in timelessness uh, in order to decide on the correct interpretation of everything for the next year or so time. But what I'm telling you is a dodge. Yes, it's a legitimate theory of time. Yes, it's an interesting theory of time. Yes, I bothered to write a co-write a paper on it. It doesn't answer the question of, if you'll excuse my language, what the fuck is time? I mean, these mysteries that are laying right under our nose are astonishing. And as long as entropy is getting in the way, all the major books say that time is about entropy. Um, and that uh, the theory of entropy gives us the arrow of time. I'm sorry, that's a dodge. We got this huge mystery and, and again, measuring an engine by its exhaust doesn't tell us how the engine works. And until we understand time, God knows <laughs> how limited our understanding will be. Science is at the very beginning. It's not even mature yet. It's just about to be born because it cannot yet deal with things like time. No, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> it's funny. I was just listening to um, Making Sense podcast with Sam Harris, the other guest, Frank Wilczek, who's got a Nobel Prize. Oh, yes, physics. Frank Wilczek. Oh, my God. And the question came up, what is time? And he gave pretty much the same answer. We have no idea. <laughs> it's kind of Amazing. a foundational concept, and they don't know how to even start taking it apart to understand it. It's just an assumption in physics right now. All right, I've got a question from Christoph. Could you say more about where you see the problems in science? theorizing methodology, ideology, and their possible causes? Well, once upon a time, I, a brilliant, I was stuck in a bed for 15 years with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And um, a guy came to visit me named Jak Panksepp. Jak Panksepp is the most brilliant researcher on emotion that this world has ever seen. It's just stunning. His work is astonishing. And he sat there at the foot of my bed and he said, well, in order to make this science, talking about my ideas of things, um, you have to figure out how to turn this into something we can test in the lab. So I stewed about that for three months and then I realized he was dead wrong. No, 
we have to learn how to take science out of the lab and into the real world to understand the real world. Not, uh, the number of things that can be reduced to a laboratory experiment is very, very small. And we're only able to get a tiny grip on reality by looking at things in terms of laboratories. Although I love lab science, I could not think without experiments on lab rats. Um, but the fact is we have to come up with a way to comprehend the real world around us. And the lab is just one tiny little step in that direction. And where I do see things going, and this is in the God problem, I was asked to fly to Moscow to address a, a conference of an international conference of quantum physicists. And that was, it was in 2005. It was because of the paper that I've been talking about that I did with Pavel Karakin from the Caldrish Institute of Applied Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And there was a new concept. But well, first of all, I told them that everything they knew about quantum physics is wrong and I won't go into my arguments, but they, I thought they were gonna throw me out of their conference. And instead they sat there beaming like proud uncles as if this had been my bar mitzvah haftor and I'd done a brilliant job. And what was going on was that the guy who'd organized this conference was looking at a simple fact. The uh, Schrodinger's equation is based on the idea that you can take an individual uh, photon and discuss its movements until it is measured as if it's solitary and on its own until it is measured. What Dr. Uh, Yuri Uzhikov had realized is photons do not function that way. They do not function as individuals. They're part of mobs. Just think of the light that we've been deciphering that came from stars born 12 billion years ago. Um, that, those photons do not travel to our eyes one at a time. They travel in such immense mobs that the light, a mob of that light can reach us 12 billion years later. I mean, that's just beyond astonishing because presu presumably that light went out in every single direction. That's massive amounts of light, but those lights travel in crowds. Those lights travel, those photons are traveling in herds. And what had made Uzhikov's new version of, of uh, quantum physics possible is the computer because he was able to simulate mobs in his computer. And he wrote a book three years after I was at that conference called Constructive Physics. And it talked about basically social and mob properties of the things that we normally regard as individuals. Because sorry, individuals really do not exist in this universe for the most part. And it's the ability to simulate these things, the way that Stephen Wolfram has been taking axioms and changing them very slightly, and then seeing what they generate in the way of a universe. Um, the, the computer makes it possible. Up until now, we've gone backwards. For example, when Piano in uh, around 1900 um, tried to reduce, it, it was a big fad at the time, reducing all of mathematics to a set of postulates, to a set of axioms. And Piano was the guy who pulled it off, who did it. Well, he was working backwards. He was working backwards from the full body of mathematics that we have today. All the stuff that you were taught in eight heavy textbooks in primary school, two, five axioms. Now that's cheating. That's working in reverse. But once we started to get computers, all of a sudden it was capable of, uh, we were able to generate a simple rule, like the rules of the game of life, John Conrad's game of life, you're, you're a checkerboard. You have a light inside of you. You can either be lit or dark. You can either be dead or alive. Um, whether you're dead or alive or not depends on how much company you have. If you have no company, you're dead. If you have a little company to a medium-sized amount of company, like two squares around you are lit, you light up. If you have too much company and you're surrounded on all eight sides, that is your four corners and your four sides um, by lit squares, they suck the oxygen out of the room, you die. That was a simple rule. 
So John Conrad was able to apply that rule on an infinite checkerboard in a computer to see what would happen. And what would happen was startling, emergent properties, these sliders and gliders that went flying across the checkerboard. Okay, what's strange about that? Well, every checkerboard in the checkerboard only understands local what's going on around it. It only understands what's going around uh, on with its eight neighbors. So how in the world does a slider, a glider, maintain an identity when every second it is composed of different checker squares? When there is no permanent team of checker checkers or checker squares that compose it. I'm not putting this very well. I hope you're understanding what I'm talking about. But, but <laughs> what became possible is that you could lay down a, and this happened around the 1980s, was that you could lay down a simple law like that and see what would happen without having a clue as to what the outcome would be, which is the way nature seems to work. Um, so the ability of computer simulations or the abilities of computer simulations may take us outside the box and into the realm of emergent properties, because that's certainly what it took us into with uh, Conway's game of life and with Wolfram's um, changing his rules just a little bit and letting the computers run for years um, and seeing what they would produce. I remember the first time I saw the game of life it was in oh. 1979 and a friend was showing me on his computer a TRS-CD Model 1 from Radio Shack. And my only memory of that was, that looks like the worst game ever. There's just nothing to do, you just watch it. <laughs> well, but, it's amazing. But since then, I've come to appreciate it, I think. Good, good. Be deep findings to be found in my game of life. All right, um, got a question from Brian Lewis. Hello. Yeah, hi. Well, hi, uh, hi, Howard. Uh, excellent oh. presentation. Sorry, Claudio, for oh. waiting oh, on Brian thought... Lewis. Hello, Brian, sorry. Hello, Howard. Ah, Brian, hi. Thank you for what you're Thank doing. Thank you for the baklava. Did you get one this week? Uh, no, I haven't gotten one this week. I, I do have a box out there somewhere. I, I lose track of things, so. Yeah, you should have had it. It was supposed to have been delivered on Monday. Brian makes this incredible baklava. It's just absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, entropy. <laughs> I have a question. Early in your presentation, you said something, I believe, about economics. Right. And I'm wondering if you could expand on your idea on, on, on economics in terms of what we're discussing today, please. Well, okay. So we talk about economics as, a, as if humans are automata. Um, and economics is not about raw numbers. Raw numbers, in fact, are measures of human emotion. <clears throat> what do I mean? When you look at a stock chart, when you look at a chart of the stock market, which I think went up today, but I haven't had a chance to look. But um, what you're seeing is a measure of raw human emotion, mass human emotion. When there's um, irrational exuberance, things go up. Um, when there's irrational pessimism or panic, things go down. Why is a panic called a panic? A panic is called a panic because a panic is a human emotion. And it's human emotions that send people fleeing from stocks or that send people rushing to stocks. Um, we talk about supply and demand. Supply and demand is all about emotion. Demand is all about emotion. Demand is about needing, wanting, aspiring to, just needing for the sake of sheer security. I mean, you take the solidity of the floor you walk on in that room that I see for granted, but that solidity has to be there. You have to pay um, workmen to construct that floor in such a way that it will always reliably be there for you. About reliability, the security of feeling that, that's an emotion. And until my book, The Genius of the Beast, The Radical Revision of Capitalism, is all about this. And it says there's a hidden imperative in capitalism. That mo most of the capitalists that I've worked with, because I've worked with a lot of big companies, 
um, have failed to see. And that is the imperative of capitalism is be messianic. Save one neighbor, you make a dollar. Save a hundred thousand neighbors, you make a hundred thousand dollars. Save a billion neighbors, you make a billion dollars. You are saving, lifting, upgrading, and empowering people through what we call the capitalist system. Um, so where does this start in the universe? Remember what happened 300,000 to 380,000 ABB after the Big Bang. These tiny little particles, relatively speaking, the size of your fist, and these giant particles, relatively speaking, the size of the Empire State Building, discovered they had an inanimate need, and their inanimate needs fit each other precisely. And they came together. That's need. Where does need fit into uh, supply and demand? Need is demand. So you and you see an exchange taking place between the proton and the electron at that very, very, very early stage of the universe. And you'll see exchanges all over the history of the universe, although they become most intense and interesting when they're among human beings. Does that in any way answer the question? Because I'm summing up a book in a paragraph. Uh, my thought was a little different, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, I go back to Chinese history, to the beginning of the Chinese empire when the country was united under the first emperor. <laughs> and he uh, ordered his court scholars to advise him about the best way to organize society, human society. And one of the recommendations that was made was not to use economics as an organizational tool because it would destroy the emotion of the family. It would destroy the honor of the family. And so it's a little bit different perception that I, that I bring to the question. And I, you know, listening to your explanation, it seems like there's a like there's an overlap, but I wonder if you would agree with that. Well, look, when I ran, I, I've run two founded and run two successful businesses, even though science is really my thing, not business. And I was in a field I knew nothing about, rock and roll, um, for uh, 15 years, and I've helped build the careers of people like. Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss, Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, people like that. And if you came to my office interested in my representing you, I gave you a little speech. And I said, look, if you expect me to fashion an artificial mask for you, an image, and sit back like a guy in a plaid suit with a cigar saying, kid, with this image, I'm going to make you a star. Um, you've come to the wrong person. I will get you an appointment with my best competitor. You'll be in his office within less than two hours. If you're going to work with me, you have to understand music is not about an exchange of pieces of plastic. Music is not about an exchange of downloads. Music is not about an exchange of money. Music is about an exchange of human soul. Yeah. So if I'm going to work with you, um, you're going to give me six weeks. I'm going to require this of you to study everything you've ever written, every interview you've ever done, every album cover you've ever put out, and then to come out to see you in your own environment with no handlers, no wives, no managers, no nothing, just you and me. And what am I going to be doing? Secular shamanism. I'm going to be dousing for your soul. What do I mean? You sit down at two o'clock in the afternoon when you've got an album due, and you know you need to write a lyric. And you know you cannot possibly write a lyric and you have no idea of how you've ever written a lyric in the past. And by four o'clock in the afternoon, there's a lyric in front of you. I'm going to find the gods inside of you that wrote that lyric. Um, you go on stage on a really good night and you see the, the eyes of the audience widening. You see their faces melting. You see them melting into one big communal blob like an amoeba. You see that amoeba send a pseudopod out to you. You have an out-of-body experience. You're up on the ceiling watching all of this take place. You see that energy from the audience go through you, go someplace to someplace around your head, be utterly transmogrified and flow back to the audience and you see their eyes widen even farther. 
and for 70 minutes you are danced on stage like a puppet. Um, it takes you time when you get off stage for your normal personality to even return to your body. I am going to find the gods inside of you that danced you on stage. And that's to me what this capitalist enterprise of the rock and roll business was really all about. The most basic thing we can know, the roots of our soul. So how does this relate to science? Hey, I wouldn't have been in this field if I didn't think it was something that was necessary um, to science. The science is my life mission, period. And this is stuff we have to understand, the ecstatic experience, um, the experience of being taken out of yourself and into something higher than you are. Um, are there scientific explanations for this? Yes, when we, go, when we become part of something bigger than we are, um, we're sensing something that we normally don't sense. You are 100 trillion cells. Um, those 100 trillion cells only know their local environment, like the checkerboards on John Conway's Game of Life. They don't know a Brian Lewis. They have no idea of what a Brian Lewis is. And we are like cells in a superorganism. But in rare moments of exaltation, we can lift out of ourselves and get some sense of the Brian Lewis, the personality. Uh, the collective personality that we are all are joined in. And occasionally we have somebody who's able to articulate that higher self. Hitler did it brilliantly. Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, um, one tribe, um, one state, and one leader. Um, those of us who believe in democracy, and I believe in democracy profoundly, have to learn how to do what Hitler did um, without the damage. Right now we have uh, a, a former president who's trying to do what Hitler did, um, but that's another story. Thank you, Howard. Howard, you think we can fit two more questions into the final 50? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Cody, you're up. Um, thank you. Um, and I have a question that's kind of ab absurd. Um, um, and real as the you know the, your your description of the beginning of the universe, um, in that um, I have a desire to fly. When I'm in my most transcendent experiences, I've had this come to me over and over and over again. Not even a desire, like I'm, there's a way I can fly. Silly, but something around consciousness, something around gravity something around weight, something around a, a, a fear, science being so misunderstood um, and in such an infant state that um, even if I figured out how to fly, I would be afraid to fly because as soon as I got in the air, someone would shoot me down and dissect me and figure out what the <laughs> hell was going on. Um, but it's real and so, I think my question is a little bit more around gravity. And since you seem to have um, explored uh, the creation of the cosmos and it's unfolding in ways that resonate a lot with what I've seen and experienced in observing the natural world, what is that? It's as illusory as time, um, in my opinion. Um, but Well, creatures what, are what, born, uh, an awful lot of creatures on this planet are born with altophilia. What does that mean? Um, it means the love of breaking the laws of gravity. Um, how do we know? Two crayfish or lobsters go against each other in the sea. They have showdowns. Male lobsters have showdowns. Male crayfish have showdowns. And what is the showdown all about? It's to see who can get his head up the highest. And he who gets his head up the highest wins and is filled with the hormones of triumph which do amazing things for him. And he who did manage to get it up enough, and that phrase, get it up, is perfectly appropriate here, um, is flooded with the hormones of loss, um, of defeat. And those hormones are hideous. Those are monstrous. So what is this contest all about? He, who can break the law of gravity? Nature's one of nature's most basic laws, the most. When two lizards, go up against each other, two male lizards in a showdown. They do exactly the same thing. 
And the lizard who gets it up the best, again, is flooded with the hormones of the vicar. And the poor lizard, and he turns bright green, and he generally goes up to the highest thing he can find around to display himself. And the lizard who lost is filled with the hormones of defeat, glucocorticoids, stress hormones. Now, stress hormones, any good thing in excess is a poison, and stress hormones in short, sharp doses are astonishing because they mobilize everything in your body. They give you energy. Um, but those hormones in long, slow doses are killers. So the lizard who loses turns brown because he's flooded with the hormones of defeat. And ultimately, how do these two lizards show who's on top and who's not? I just use it in an, an altophilic term, who's on top and who's not. Through he who can defy nature's most basic law of gravity the best. Um, you'll see this all through nature. So our dreams of flying, our dreams of heights, um, our language about status having to do with who's on top and who's not all have to do with defying the laws of gravity and he who defies the laws of gravity most is the highest on the social totem pole. Um, so, and, and which goes back to nature loves those who oppose her most. How do we know? Nature creates these contests to defy her laws. Um, in the sea, there are Thai fighting fish. How do Thai, male Thai fighting fish compete with each other? They build bubble palaces. You know the, what happens to bubbles in water. They go up, right? And then they burst at the surface. Well, a Thai fighting fish grabs these bubbles and takes them down, defying the law, in his case, of buoyancy. And he who can build the biggest bubble palace beneath the surface, the biggest pile of bubbles, defying buoyancy, wins the girls, wins the sexual competition. Again, nature loves those who oppose her most. Why? Because we are the antennae of a cosmos feeling out her possibilities. And how does she achieve her next supersized surprise? By utterly breaking her own laws. And who and how does she do that through? Us, whether we're lizards, lobsters, puppies, because they also have height contests, or Thai fighting fish. Um, so see if that helps at all. But, but you know, once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a group of dinosaurs. Now, I'm gonna tell you what happened, what happened happened in genetic terms, but I'm gonna tell you the story in anthropomorphic terms so you can understand what the genes were up to. And these dinosaurs were rebels. And these dinosaurs wanted to break the law of gravity. They wanted to fly. Now, if you and I had been traditional dinosaurs, we would have gone to them and said, look, you're crazy. There's nothing to eat up there. There's no place to make a nest up there. What are you gonna eat? Clouds, the stars at night. Um, everything good is down here on nature's bosom where all green things reside. So stay here, be naturalists, um, eat organic um, and forget about this wacky dream of yours. Well, when you went out for a walk today how many of the dinosaurs who stuck to the traditional and organic ways of doing things did you see? Zero. And how many of the loony dinosaurs who decided to fly did you see? Probably at least 10, because they're called birds. What does that mean nature is telling us? Aspire to the skies, break my laws, break the law of gravity. And what does that mean for human beings? It means there's only one species, that, look, we're not the only ones capable of research and development. You've seen that with the development of COVID and its seven new variants. Um, and you see it with bacteria who are extremely good at working their way around our defenses and our antibiotics. So, and, and bacteria are 12 miles beneath your feet right now, turning raw rock into biomass, into food and fuel. Autolithotrophs, they're called. Litho, we're eating sown. Um, the only thing we can do that no other creatures can do, or one of the things we can do, is take life out of the gravity well. If once upon a time there was this incredibly hostile ball of stone, and it was the home of climate catastrophe, 
every three hours, its temperature went up 88 degrees and then three hours later down 88 degrees. First, it was bathed in this poisonous stuff, radiation, light. Then it was bathed in something equally poisonous, darkness. Um, and it had a tilt. And because of that tilt, it went through these four giant climate changes a year that we call summer, winter, fall, and spring. And yet life dared to take hold here and dared to try to green and garden the place. In the face of 148 mass extinctions, life greened and gardened this poison pill of stone. How many poison pills of stone are there above our heads just waiting to be gardened and greened? And we are the only ones who can take ecosystems beyond the skies. I promise the last question to Lewis. Hello, Howard. It's a Lewis, pleasure hi. to see you and meet you. Oh my God. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you too. <laughs> and so I come as a very, um, how do I say this? Like, uh, I only very recently learned about you in the universe. And right. I can, I mean, it's, it was like maybe a month ago or so. And I immediately, like, I read the invite to this event. Then I saw like, this person is challenging conventional ideas. I said, oh, that's my kind of person. I, I'm reading this one great so quickly. I've got two other of your books and I'm just hit with the Howard fever, as a friend said. Um, so it's a thrill to be with you. And I have a couple of questions. I know that we are short in time, so I'm going to go to the chase. Uh, I love how you put that the universe is not coming apart, but actually blooming and organizing. And this brings to mind the notion from biomimicry and regenerative cultures of how life creates conditions conducive to life. So it's exciting to think that there may be a guardrail or a physical law of sorts that makes the universe tend to new configurations that probe possibilities and to enable those experiments to continue to happen. So that's prefacing, you know, just a comment. Now, the question is, we see, however, some, a lot of humans and the systems we have created behaving in ways that destroy the conditions that allow life to bloom. And so my question is, why do you think that is? Or do you see this in a different light? Well, I do see it in a different light. And look, once upon a time, bacteria despoiled and raped the virginal surface of this planet. Um, they managed to find fissures, tiny little fissures in, again, virgin rock. And they went into those fissures and they built homes for themselves. And they built the equivalent of giant bubble colonies using things like titanium dioxide, all kinds of unnatural chemicals, which they gathered around them. And then they left these homes behind them when the colonies died. They were, there, there are a number of sins that we talk about all the time, materialism, consumerism, waste, and vain display. And bacteria were guilty of materialism. They gathered all this material stuff in order to create their mega cities because there are more bacteria in a colony the size of your palm than all the humans who've ever existed. Um, and they left behind their housing, littering the landscape, right? Um, well, the litter that they created became the mud at the bottom of the sea. And the mud at the bottom of the sea became the foundation for life. So there is no such thing as waste. Materialism, sorry, this is an incredibly materialist universe. We described gravity balls, accumulating what? Stuff, accumulating matter. That's how we got stars. That's how we got planets. Um, this is the way the universe operates. And we may not be the ones who can take advantage of our waste and garbage, but something will come along that does. And in fact, if you drive your car past a great big landfill, there's one out on Staten Island, it's on a landfill, it's a garbage dump. You will see more seagulls than you ever imagined existed on the face of the earth. Why? Because what we have thrown out as detritus, as litter, um, is food for them. It's manna from heaven for them. Life is, we can beat ourselves up all we want about our materialism and our consumerism, but that's the way the universe does business. And if we can't take advantage, and, and look, it's our job to be as clean as possible, right? It's our job to constantly advance. It's our job to constantly turn garbage into treasure, to turn garbage into gold. 
it's our job to take things that we always regarded as of no value whatsoever and make them a valuable part of the bioprocess. Just like those autolithotrophs, those bacteria 12 miles beneath your feet are busy taking rock. They don't think we've run out of resources, far from it. There's so much rock down there that it defies belief. It, all we've run out of is imagination, not resources. Should we stop littering? Absolutely. We should do everything we can to function in the greenest, most wonderful way possible. Everything in our power. But meantime, let us recognize once upon a time, there were worms and worms ate their way through everything they could and then shat. And because they're not good at building sewage systems, they left the shit where it was. And what do we call that shit? that detritus, that garbage, that toxic pollutant. Um, we call it Earth. And we've named our planet after it. So in nature, there is no such thing as garbage. There is no such thing as a toxic pollutant. Every toxic pollutant is an opportunity waiting for the first beast that will come along and learn how to eat it and turn it into something good, meaning something that's part of the life process because I'm a life chauvinist. Might I put an additional question to this? Yes, Very absolutely. Good. Thank you. Uh, and I completely agree with what you said that in nature, there is no waste. Uh, I might have uh, posed my question a tiny bit better and saying the conditions that allow human life to bloom, because it, as you said, uh, crap turns into, uh, well, garbage into gold and so on. So seeing that, as you said, we need humans to do a better job of living um, and living in a more green way, as you said, how would you go about using the lessons that you've learned from the book with uh, the music business and collective soul and so on to mobilize more and more hearts and souls in that direction? Well, I wish I had that capability, but what I did in the music industry was very slowly and methodically build up a set of contacts so that there were important people in the media who would take my phone calls. I had very deliberately worked my way up um, to a position of influence. And I had created a whole new way of doing publicity in the music industry. And I had trained people from scratch in doing that. And I ended up with the biggest staff in the music industry. I wish I had that privilege now that I'm heavily involved in the space community. I've written a, uh, a manifesto, a visual manifesto for the future of life and humanity called Garden the Solar System, Green the Galaxy. Um, I right now, um, I'm trying to get across, I've got a little political group and it includes David Patterson, the former governor of New York State, who's a Democrat like I am, and Newt Gingrich, who obviously isn't a Democrat like I am. And we're trying to get across the fact that if we harvest solar power in space and transmit it to earth using the kind of harmless waves that your cell phone uses, um, that is the Green New Deal, because we can stop the man-made emission of, of greenhouse gases completely, 100% forever. We can end the use of fossil fuels for energy production forever. And according to my former partner in this, the two of us worked our asses off on this uh, until he died, Dr. APJ Kalam, the 11th president of India. Kalam said we can lift 2 billion people out of poverty. Well, I wish I had the machine that I built so carefully and methodically in the music industry now to get this idea across that space can save the earth, that harvesting solar power in space is the Green New Deal. It will produce not just jobs, but the nation that owns space solar power is going to own the earth um, in the middle 21st century. Uh, and China has plans to own space solar power by 2035, and it's already built its first factory exclusively for space solar power components. We just laid that when I went and met with the Chinese Academy of Space Technology people in, in Chengdu 10 years ago, 11 years ago, it was obvious they had something we didn't have in the United States. Their space solar power effort had funding for the last 10 years. And that's 21 years ago um, that they started to get funding for space solar power. We just got our first funding for space solar power in the last five years. So we are behind the curve on this. But it takes meticulously building your contacts and meticulously building a team that knows how to do what you have taught them how to do to have an influence. And right now, my major task is to write these, if you'll excuse the expression, to write these fucking books 
because I've got a limited amount of time. I'm 77 years old. It takes five years to write a book. I have two books that I need to write. One is The Case of the Sexual Cosmos, Everything You Know About Nature is Wrong. And the second is The Grand Unified Theory in the universe, of Everything in the Universe, Including Sex, Violence, and the Human Soul. And I have to get those two books out before they shovel me into a coffin. So I no longer have the time and the energy to build a PR apparatus. And I need it more for the stuff we're talking about than I ever needed it for rock and roll. Hmm. Might there be a way to keep in touch with you about these things? Because this is my bread and butter. Well, I have, there's a group, it's organized around me. I didn't organize it. You know, there's a movie out about me called The Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom. And people have seen that I want to have a Howard Bloom Institute so that my ideas can be advanced after I'm gone. Um, look, when I was 10 years old and totally unwanted by all the other kids in Buffalo, New York, and my parents had no time or no interest in me, I was saved by two guys, Galileo and Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who reached out across the distance of 350 years and caught me before I could fall. So my job is to reach out over the next 350 years and catch the next poor, confused kid before he or she can fall. So that's what the Howard Bloom Institute exists for. And it's a team right now of about eight very dedicated people uh, all the way from Germany to LA. And if you were interested in joining that team, it meets once every two weeks and, um, and you could be part of this. I would so, love that. So just get in touch with me. David knows how to get in touch with me or I'll give you my email address. It's, are you ready? Uh, it's Howl, H-O-W-L, like wolves howling at the moon or like the poem by Allen Ginsberg. Howell Bloom, B-L-O-O-M, at AOL.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Howard. <laughs> I hope so to look forward to, to seeing you. I look forward to seeing you in the future. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you, David, for putting this together. My pleasure. Um, we are out of time, but the good news is this is just the first of three sessions in this series. Um, Howard, what can we expect next time, next week? Well, next time we will try to get into the birth of the first molecules, molecular genesis, um, and, and, the, and, and those molecules coming together in giant social teams. Um, and some of those giant social teams being capable of manic mass production and total narcissism, making copies of themselves, another materialist consumerist process. Um, because that's the beginning of life. So we will try to get into the early stages of life next time and, and bring it up to humans. Because in the third session, we'll do humans. All right. Thank you all for coming here. And thank you so much, Howard. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. We'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.